Um, all right, Twilio. Let's get the audience first. How many of you here have used Twilio in the past? All right, there's eh, about 10 of you. How it's many 9 a.m., the developers are it, here. It is, yeah. the, the developers are still coding somewhere, in a, they're still on their pen somewhere. Uh, how many of you have received an SMS notification from Uber, or Deliveroo, or one of those services? All right, that, so you've all used Twilio in some form or another, you just didn't know it because all of that is probably powered by, by you guys. Um, Jeff, you guys have raised 235 million. You're part of the exclusive Unicorn Club. It seems like most people don't really know what you do yet. Just 30 seconds, explain to us what you do. Absolutely, we are a developer platform in the cloud uh, for communications. So we allow software developers to add communications, whether it's voice, text, and now video uh, into their applications. And our idea is that every application eventually needs to communicate with its users, and Twilio is how you do that. And it's actually, we're part of a larger story here, which is that you know, in recent years, new cloud platforms have arisen to power modern cloud applications. Right? So whether those platforms are you know, cloud computing platforms like EC2, cloud payments platforms like Stripe or Braintree, uh, cloud storage platforms like S3, well, Twilio is a cloud communications platform that allows your applications to communicate. Right, you're the AWS of communications, basically. Can you say that? Yeah. Well, it's, um, that's what you are today. But you've been doing this for seven years, and you've, you've, you, th this is not your first rodeo. You did some startups before this. You were the CTO of... Stop up the ticketing marketplace. You can translate that via GoGo. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Um, you you did a physical. You, you were the CTO for a physical commerce place that did extreme, extreme sports. Sport, yeah. The, skateboarding, 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 surfing. Yeah. So you've done a few things. You didn't stick around at those places for all that long. You've been at Twilio for seven years. What was the what what happened with those original startups? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, Twilio is the fourth startup uh, that I've that I've been on the founding team of, and uh, you know, my first one I actually started when I was in college. Uh, it was a academic website for college students. We started it during the dot com days, um, and uh, we provided free lecture notes for college kids. And you know, more than anything, we actually wanted an excuse to play around with the internet uh, because it was the mid '90s and the internet was this brand new thing. And I was uh, studying computer science and just wanted an excuse to build on this new uh, this new platform called the web. And you wanted to help students cheat? Uh, is that what you're saying? It wasn't cheating. It was uh, lecture notes so that uh, you could get another student's perspective. Uh, now, you could use them if you didn't go to the lecture. Uh, we found that students that used them instead of going to the lecture like, didn't end up doing all that well. <laughs> uh, but if you use them as a supplemental uh, to your own lecture notes, because a lot of students are not the best note takers, or if they spend all the time scribbling down the notes, you actually lose sight of the big picture. Anyway, um, so we did that, and like, it, was a, it was a blast. We were building a product for our peer group, college students, and a uh, typical dot-com ride, right? We grew it up, we raised some money, sold it to a competitor, a competitor went bankrupt in the, in the crash. Um, after that uh, was the first uh, CTO of StubHub. Right. And you know, a funny thing happened at StubHub. I was about, uh, I think, nine or 12 months into it, and I kind of realized that I, I myself wasn't a big concert goer, was not a big uh, sports uh, you know, live sports enthusiast. And so I wasn't the target customer for StubHub because I wasn't using our product and I didn't identify with the customer who was. And once I realized that, it was just sort of e-commerce for something else. Mm -hmm. And that was not enough to get me through the really hard times, like the blood, sweat, and tears you put into a startup. Uh, you know, I remember we had to get the site launched in six weeks from the time we started coding it. And so we were doing 20-hour days, you know, late nights, lots of caffeine, that whole, that whole thing. And at the end of the day, you're like, God, I don't really viscerally feel the need for the world to have this product. Like, yes, it's a good business opportunity, but I don't connect with the product or the customer. And so I ended up leaving, and through a fairly convoluted path, uh, ended up starting this bricks-and-mortar retailer for extreme sporting goods. Why would you do Snow that? Skateboarding, snowboarding, surfing. So I, I don't know if you can tell. I mean, I don't, I don't exactly have the, the extreme physique I, I'm no, I'm, you come I'm to not, expect. I'm not the one to judge right? you. So, <laughs> so um, oh, hello, microphone. <laughs> um, and so 
it's like, you know, I, I wasn't a skater, I'm not a surfer, I didn't do these sports. I was building a lot of really interesting technology as far as like, what does it mean to build a, a modern software infrastructure to run a retailer? But I didn't really care about the product we were selling per se, or the customer we were selling to. In fact, I came to actually hate our customers. Because I was in the back room of this skate shop writing code, building a point of sale system, shipping and receiving, back of house, a bunch of customer facing things. I'm writing code and right outside, the other side of the wall, you have these kids who are grinding with their skateboards every surface in the store. And we built the store so they could grind. We wanted them to do it. But meanwhile, I'm trying to write code and all I'm hearing is this banging on the, you know, all day. That, that didn't help driving you? Driving me nuts. You? And I came to just like, hate, like, I hate you, kids. And I hate these skateboards that we're selling to you. And I was like the grumpy old, like, geek in the back. And I was like, you know, it, it's time to go. Because when you, when you actively dislike the market you're serving, your customers and the product, you're like, man, that is not how you want to be spending your 20 hours a day, you know, blood, sweat, and tears startup land. How long and, did you stay there? Uh, you know, I worked on, on, on Nine Star was the name. And I worked on that for several years. Right. Um, and, um, and I just realized, like, this isn't how you should spend your life, right? Like, having this level of, of disconnect between, like, why you're putting your soul into something and then the, the satisfaction you get from it. And so uh, that's when I went to Amazon, had a great time at Amazon, and I left Amazon because uh, I knew it was time to start my next thing again. I want to talk about that for a moment. You go from doing your own thing to becoming an employee at Amazon. You would early on at AWS, right? Yeah. But what is that like, just going from being a founder back to being that guy in the cubicle who's working on stuff for But you know, company? it wasn't going back to, because I had never actually done it. And that was why I wanted to do okay. it, which is, you know, I had done three startups in a row, and I had this notion that if I'm successful as an entrepreneur, I'm going to build a large, meaningful business one day. That that's what, you know, for me at least, success looked like. And I realized that I had no perspective on what that actually meant. Like, what was it I was building? Because I'd never seen it. Like, I knew that there were these big, tall buildings with a, a, a corporate logo at the top. And, you know, people walked in at nine and walked out at five. But I had no idea what they did in the middle. Like, I, I'm, I bet they have meetings and stuff. Like, I don't even know. Um, and so I wanted to work at what I thought was a well-run, larger company so that I would have this model in my head of as I'm building a company, here are the things that I want to make sure to, to replicate. Here are the things I want to make sure to avoid because I don't have any idea of what I'm building towards uh, as I'm building a company. And that's why I went to Amazon and I really enjoyed it. I mean, really smart people. Uh, I do believe that it's a, that it's a good company uh, that really empowers employees uh, to, to serve their customers, very customer-centric organization. So I learned a ton there. But uh, you know, after a couple of years, I was when I said, okay, you know, I want to venture back out and start my next thing again. Start a unicorn. That's, I mean, what, what made you want to get into the telecoms industry? Because that's basically what you're doing. Well, you know, never had any intention really to be a part of, of the telecommunications industry, um, other than to say we were solving our own problem, which gets back to the passion, right? Um, it was a problem that I had had multiple, all three of those companies in the past, uh, which was at one point or another, I saw two common threads between all three of those companies. Number one is each one of those companies were using the power of software to iterate very rapidly, right? The iterative spirit of software is how we were disrupting the market that we were in, how we were challenging the incumbents in the space with a better customer experience by constantly shipping software that answered our customers' problems. Uh, but common thread number two was that one point or another in all three of those companies, we had needed communications at one point or another in order to power a great customer experience. And I'm not talking about like a desk phone for the employees. I mean something that was deeply integrated into the software we were building that would affect the customer experience in a meaningful way. Um, so I'll give you an example. When we were doing StubHub, we made the decision that you could buy a live event ticket just an hour before the event and that we get it delivered to you just in time. And that's how we were going to compete with the street commerce going on outside of the stadiums, right? The, the scalping went up. And so uh, we said, how are we going to have a ticket delivered in real time? Well, so, well, you know, when a ticket sells, we'll automate a phone call to the seller uh, of the ticket and say, hey, seller, your ticket sold. Congratulations. We're sending a courier to pick it up from you. Then we'd automatically dial down the list of couriers we worked with in that city until we found one who could do the job. Then we'd dial the buyer and say, hey, buyer, courier is showing up in five minutes at this street corner. Make sure you're there. 
Did that work? I, I don't know, because we said, well, we're software developers. We don't know the first thing about communications. Uh, this is back in the year 2000. So we turned to the industry. And we said, how are we supposed to solve this? And the industry said, sure, we can help you with that. First, you're going to wire up all these copper lines to your data center. Then you're going to rack up all these telco you know, gear. And then you're going to bring in professional services to come and integrate all that stuff together. And that'll be about uh, $2 million. And it'll take us 24 months to build. You know, sign here. It's fast enough. Right? And we're like, well, aside from the fact that we don't have $2 million, we're a startup, two years in software is an insane amount of time, right? Software developers ship every two weeks, right? We, we do sprints, we keep a backlog. We're always listening to the customer, reprioritizing our roadmap, and always iterating towards what's most important to our customers. And it's so the idea that you'd embark on some project today that's gonna take two years before you get the first version, before you get any customer validation from, is just insane. And I realized that the world of communications was just diametrically opposed to the ethos of software. And it's because it's had a 150-year history, a legacy that's deeply tied to like physical networks, copper wires, fiber optics, you know, servers in the closets of telcos. And as software people, that just didn't work for us. And so we started Twilio to really bring communications from that legacy in hardware to its future, which is in software. And if you believe, as we do, that developers are going to build this software-based communications future that we're heading into, then we're a platform that empowers those software developers to build rapidly, iteratively, and use the full power of software to get there. That's really the story of the industry in some way, but you're still working in that ecosystem where you, are, you have to deal with, the, with the, the telecoms. Maybe 10 years ago, there were still monopolies, and you have to deal with them today. What's it like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's two aspects of our business. You know, one side is we deal with uh, software developers uh, all, the day, all day, and like, you know, that's my background, that's, you know, that's our customers that we serve. But we do deal quite a bit with the world's uh, carriers, and uh, we interconnect with uh, over 100 carriers around the world um, to provide the Toyota services that we do. And, um, you know, it's interesting, they're, they're, they're partners to us, right? Um, I think we bring something to the table, being very software-oriented and understanding software developers and, and what it takes to make software developers successful. Um, and, you know, carriers are very good. You know, they own these physical assets that are immensely valuable and hard to build, right? Whether it's, you know, wireless networks and owning immensely valuable spectrum and operating it or physical wires and stuff like that. Um, that's immensely uh, valuable stuff that they do. And I think that uh, that partnership is a very good one that we have because we are bringing now new use cases and new customers to the door building things that, quite frankly, didn't exist before and didn't exist because the barriers to innovation were so high. And by bringing those barriers down and letting any developer get up and running and build a prototype and test out an idea in an afternoon for just a few dollars really changes the way in which developers can incorporate communications into their apps. And so it ends up being a really good partnership because of how we can approach the developer uh, mindset and how we can empower developers to do those experiments, test out a new idea, and if it's successful, scale it out, um, actually brings new use cases and new revenues to, to carriers around the world, which is a good thing for, for everybody. Did they, did they see that in the early days, though? Did they try to kill you? I mean, not you personally, but did they try <laughs> there, to kill you? There were assassins Twilio? in every corner. <laughs> I mean, yeah. did, was, that, was it always like that? Was it always this relatively? No, you know, early on, uh, you know, carriers didn't exactly know what to make of us. I mean, I remember when uh, GroupMe was built at the TechCrunch Disrupt uh, Hackathon in uh, New York yeah. in 2011, I think. And sold to Facebook later and, on. And sold to Facebook eventually, yep. Uh, you know, carriers didn't know what to make of that. They're like, wait, they're using this, you know, over the top, and there's group messaging, and, you know, the carriers did not understand it. Um, and uh, they, did, they did, in the early days, you know, want to shut down GroupMe and shut down Twilio, and like, they were very worried about what this meant, and it took us, you know, we did a lot of work to show carriers, look, this is good for you. It is providing both developers the ability to innovate and build new use cases that didn't exist, as well as provide services that your end subscribers want to use. You know, end users wanted to engage with GroupMe, it was a fantastic application. And, uh, and so it's one of these everybody wins, but it's different. And so that took some explaining about why it's good for everyone involved. Uh, and I, you know, I'm happy to say that um, you know, 
we've gotten past that. And I think carriers now do understand the value that uh, developers bring and you know, love the applications that are getting built, you know, whether it's you know, Uber or Lyft or over-the-top apps uh, that uh, provide new revenue streams to carriers. Uh, carriers have already made their fixed investments in their networks. Sure. And now we're, uh, well, along with developers, helping to um, bring them new use cases and help them monetize it further. If they love you so much now, if they try to buy you, you know, I can't really speak to anything along those lines. Uh, what I can say is, you know, there's people inside of carriers who are big fans of what we do, and there's people still inside of carriers who aren't big fans <laughs> of what we do. Uh, you know, ca carriers, like any sufficiently large and complex organization, doesn't have a single viewpoint. Uh, it's a collection of individuals with all of their perspectives, both professionally and personally. Uh, but what I can say that is... That was uh, very nicely put, right? <laughs> what I can say is I think we've got very good relationships with carriers, and we're working, uh, as we always do, very hard to continually build more bridges, both into the developer world as well as into the carrier world. All right, all right. That, that's about as much as I expected you would say about that. <laughs> um, but talking about acquisitions, though, you, you've got a bit of a war chest. You've got 235 million, right? Something like that, that you've raised. You could make your own acquisitions. You've only made one, and that was a security company, a two-factor authentication security company, Authy, about two years ago or two years ago. That's the only acquisition you've made. What, why is that? Why, why haven't you gone out and yeah, done we're, more? We're really excited to bring, uh, to bring Authy on board with Twilio. Uh, for any of you who don't know, Authy is a two-factor authentication API for developers uh, that was built on top of Twilio. And so there we saw this really neat opportunity where if you were a developer building two-factor auth, right, that's when you try to log into, you know, say, you know, Box or, you know, some application that you use, and they text you a six-digit pin for you to enter uh, in order to get in, right, that's two-factor auth. And we have found a lot of developers are building that on top of Twilio. In fact, many times when you do have a two-factor auth workflow, uh, you're using Twilio behind the scenes. But every time a developer built that, they had to go figure out for themselves right, how best to build it. What's a good user experience? How do I make it secure? Um, and it would sometimes take a while to figure out all those pieces of the solution, uh, even though we made sending the text message very easy. Uh, and so with Authy, we found this opportunity to allow the developer just to get up and running that more quickly. Because mm -hmm. instead of using an SMS API, you're using a two-factor Auth API. And if you're building that use case, then why reinvent the wheel? Just use something that is built for that purpose and get up and running that much more quickly. And you know, for us, it was about getting to you know, Git push uh, faster than ever before. Now you're geeking out at this point. But, <laughs> um, but uh, to ask why we don't, haven't done more, uh, we, you know, acquisition, we're always looking at opportunities. But acquisitions are a really hard thing to get right. Okay. And so I think we as a company have had a fairly high bar for when we're going to do an acquisition. Uh, knowing how much organizational energy it takes to successfully accomplish, and also um, you know, the number of things that can go wrong in an acquisition, and there are a lot. And so we've just always had a pretty high bar for when we want to do acquisitions, uh, as well as um, you know, when we do it, put a lot of concerted energy into doing it right. Uh, and so that's the way we look at it, and, and um, we don't have a particular strategy that says don't do acquisitions or do do acquisitions. It's very much every opportunity is we look at um, as its own opportunity. Let's talk about the company as it is today for a moment. Um, are you profitable? Uh, we, uh, we haven't talked much about our profitability of the company. What I can say is that uh, you know, we've raised uh, a, a good deal of investor money, as you noted. And the reason for that is you know, while we are unit profitable, so you know, what we sell, we sell at a profit, uh, we are investing very heavily in the growth of the company. You know, this is something you'll often hear from, from startups, right, who have raised money. And, you know, for us, the reason is that <coughs> we see one of these once-in-a-lifetime opportunities where you've got one of the world's, you know, leading industries as far as size and importance and all that, which is communications, that is at a crossroads. You know, it's at this once-in-a-lifetime or multiple-lifetimes um, uh, point of inflection where it's migrating from a 150-year legacy in hardware to a future which is going to be software. And that migration means there's so many opportunities uh, to help uh, developers, to help companies, to help the entire industry move to this future, which is very clearly in front of us. And so as a company, we're investing quite heavily in, in you know, building a company and building the technology and building the customer base uh, to help affect that change that's going on. And that's what gets us so excited, right? The opportunity to have an impact 
on such an important field of communications, right? I like to think of it as, you know, there's basically two things that separate the human species, right, from, from other animals. It's building and it's communicating. And uh, Twilio is at the intersection of both of those things. And so what's uh, fundamentally more human than, than you know, building and communicating? Uh, and that's what makes uh, it so exciting for the point in time where we are in the world where communications is undergoing such a dramatic shift. So you're helping us drive evolution, that's what you're saying. Um, <laughs> in, just to, to round it up, I can't let you go without this, answering this question. Your revenue is probably under a billion dollars. You could file for an IPO quietly, uh, secretly maybe. What, what are your plans? Are you going to IPO? Because you've raised so much money, you don't have that many options in the, in the market probably. To, yeah, to our raise. goal is to build a, uh, a long-term standalone business. Uh, we believe that communications and where communications is going presents so many opportunities that our goal is to build a meaningful business. And, uh, That's sort of, a non-answer right there. Yeah, well, does that mean <laughs> uh, an IPO potentially one day? Sure. If and when you know, the situation is right, then you know, that makes sense for building a long-term uh, business. But uh, we have no, uh, you know, the IPO is not a goal in and of itself. That's just a means uh, to building a long-term business. So someday, if and when it's right, that's probably something we would do. All right. So by the time it's right, we'll have you back, and then we'll talk about it again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.